Hello and welcome to Lee TV's Jordan Peterson compilation series. Lectures compilation follows hot on the heels of Jordan Peterson Angry Moments and Best Comebacks Volumes 1 and 2, which both went viral on my YouTube channel. This video features a compilation of the eloquent psychology professor's best moments lecturing in front of a crowd or classroom, including a young Jordan B talking about the life of Buddha. So sit back, relax and enjoy Lectures compilation. There's this idea in Jungian psychology called the circumambulation. And Jung had this idea that you had a potential future self, which would be in potential, everything that you could be. And that it manifests itself moment to moment in your present life by making you interested in things. And the things that you're interested in are the things that would guide you along the path that would lead you to maximal development. Now, it sounds like a metaphysical idea or a or a mystical idea even, but, but it's not, it's, it's not, it's a really profoundly biological idea. The idea is something like, well, you're set up so that you're automatically interested in those things that would fully expand you as a well-adapted creature. Well, like, there's nothing radical about that idea. How el what else could possibly be the case, unless there's something fundamentally flawed about you? That is what the, the situation would be. It's kind of interesting to think about how that would be manifest moment to moment, but the idea is something like, well, your interest is captured by those things that lead you down the path of development. Well, that better be the case. Okay, so that's fine. And so there's some utility in pursuing those things that you're interested in. That's the call to adventure, let's say. So, and the call to adventure takes you all sorts of places. Now, the problem with the call to adventure is, like, what the hell do you know? You might be interested in things that are kind of warped and bent. And often it's the case that when new parts of people manifest themselves and grip their interests, say, they do it very badly and shoddily. And so you stumble around like an idiot when you try to do something new. That's why the fool is the precursor to the savior from the, from the symbolic perspectives. Because you have to be a fool before you can be a master. And if you're not willing to be a fool, then you can't be a master. I think it was Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, I think, who said, one of the advantages to telling the truth is that you don't have to remember what you said. And that, God, that's worth listening to because... So uh, there's a bunch of things I've learned as a clinician. And one of them is, because you're often in really weird situations with people if you're a clinician, because things happen that don't happen normally, and you don't know what to do. And so what I've learned is I just say, what, I just say what's happening, whatever it is, regardless of what it is. You know, I'll just try to describe it as accurately as I can, and not worry about, in some sense, not worry about the consequences. You know, like I'm not going out of my way to cause trouble, but if you're in a really, and I'm telling you, this can save your life at times, especially if you're dealing with someone who's paranoid, who's really paranoid. You do not lie to someone who's paranoid and violent. Because as soon as you lie, you're aligned with the forces that are persecuting them. And they're going to be, because paranoia makes people hypervigilant, like they're on amphetamines, in fact, you can make pe people paranoid by giving them enough amphetamines. And you can make paranoid people more paranoid by giving them amphetamines. So they're hypervigilant because they feel that everything is predatory and against them. And so they're watching you like you would not believe, way more than you're watching them. And if you flicker a lie while you're talking to them, and they're really on the edge, you, you're done. So it's, it's one thing to really know if you're ever in a really bad situation, and you don't know what to do. You tell the truth minimally. You don't disclose too much. That's just another lie. You tell the truth minimally and carefully and hopefully. And you might get out of it. You might get out of it. But if you falsify it, look the hell out. So the truth is a real, is a real mechanism of protection in dangerous situations. Buddha's father is visited by an angel who tells him that his son is going to grow up to be the greatest temporal, profane ruler the world has ever seen, or a great spiritual leader. And his father, being a pragmatic and conservative man, decides that there's no possible way I'm going to allow my son to take the ambivalent road of spiritual enlightenment. I'm going to allow him to fall completely in love with the world so that he will remain attached to his domain. So, prior to Buddha's birth, his father constructs a great city with walls around it. And inside that city, he 
removes all signs of pain, frustration, and disappointment, any sign of ugliness the, and age. The only people that are allowed to exist within this city are those who are in perfect mental and physical health, who are paragons of beauty and virtue. And the idea that lurks behind that archetypal story is that when a father has a child, the, his moral obligation is to shield the developing consciousness of that child from contact with any of the horrors of life that could provide the child with an experience too traumatic for that developing consciousness to apprehend. So, because it's an archetypal story, it relates to the development of all people, not just the redemptive savior. And that's the motif that the Buddhist story initially follows. A good father makes his child fall in love with life by enticing that child into a direct relationship with all that life has to offer. So Buddha grows up within this walled garden, this unself-conscious paradise. But precisely because he's been shielded to this degree and allowed to mature, his consciousness continues to expand and the world outside the boundaries that his parents have established for him starts to attract his attention. Now, we know already that the forbidden fruit, right, the lure of what's outside the walls is something that human beings just can't keep their mangy little paws off, right? We are absolutely uncontrollably curious and the best way to make sure that we investigate something is to lay down a stricture that says whatever you do under whatever circumstances never look there, right? And then the automatic systems that underlie our orienting and that motivate our seeking experience are constantly pulling our attention precisely to that forbidden spot, compelling us to investigate exactly that which has been forbidden. So because Buddha is a consciousness developing in a healthy manner, he immediately becomes curious about what lies beyond the the limits that have been established with him and he makes a decision to go outside of paradise. Right, which seems a particularly ridiculous thing to do given that in principle he has everything he could possibly want inside the walls but then again we have the troublesome notion of the original sin of Adam right which is that if any of you were offered a forbidden fruit again under circumstances mythologically equivalent to those that obtain in the beginning you'd immediately reach your hand out and take it because what we haven't got for human beings is always far more compelling than what we have got your attention, for example, is mediated by unconscious forces. And you know that, you know that perfectly well. And this is another Freudian observation. You know, if you're sitting down to study, for example, your conscious intent is to study. But you know perfectly well that all sorts of distraction fantasies are going to enter the theater of your imagination non-stop and annoyingly. And, and there isn't really a lot you can do about that except maybe wait it out. You know, so you'll be sitting there reading and your attention will flicker away. You'll think about, oh, I don't know, maybe you want to watch Jane the Virgin on Netflix or something like that. Or maybe it's time to have a peanut butter sandwich. Or you should get the dust bunnies from un out from underneath the bed. Or it's time to go outside and have a cigarette. Or maybe it's time for a cup of coffee. Or it's like all these subsystems in you that would like something aren't very happy just to sit there while you read this thing that you're actually bored by. And so they pop up and try to take control of your perceptions and your actions non-stop. Maybe you think, well, this is a stupid course anyways. Why do I have to read this damn paper? And what am I doing in university? And what's the point of life? It's like, you can really, well, you can really get going if you're trying to avoid doing your homework. And, and, and then you might think, well, what is it in you that's trying to avoid? Because after all, you took the damn course and you told yourself to sit down. Why don't you listen? Well, because you're, you're a mess. That's basically why. You, you haven't got control over yourself at all. And no more than I have control over this laptop. <laughs> it's, it's an error. <clears throat> error-ridden process, and that's also laid out in the Old Testament stories because the first thing that happens to all these patriarchal figures when God kicks them out of their father's house when they're like 84 is that they, they run into all sorts of trouble and some of it's social and some of it's natural and some of it's a consequence of their own moral inadequacy. So they're fools. And, but, but the thing that's so interesting is that despite the fact that they're fools, they're still supposed to go on the adventure and that they're capable of learning enough as a consequence of moving forward on the adventure so that they straighten themselves out across time. And so it's something like this. So this circumambulation that Jung talked about was this 
continual, we'll return to this, this continual circling in some sense of who you could be. You might notice, for example, that there are themes in your life, you know, when you go back across your experiences, you see you kind of have your typical experience that sort of repeats itself. And there might be variation on it, like a musical theme, but it's, it's like you're, you're circling yourself and getting closer to yourself as you move across time. That's the circumambulation. Now, you remember that for a sec, because we'll go back to it. Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea. Because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so, the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure, that you're going to get it right the first time, is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea. And which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until it's waiting for Godot, until they finally got it right. But the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help. Because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. One time I was in an airport, and uh, we were in this lineup to fly back to Canada that said international flights. And so it was a long lineup, like 50 people, and we got a I got about three from the front, there were still like 40 people behind me, and the guy behind the counter decided that he was just going to shut down the line and that we could all go to this other line, which was like 300 people long. And I suggested that he not do that, because we'd been standing there for half an hour, and that he could just deal with the 20 of us that were left and, and like, have a clue. And so he called the sheriff right away. And this was down in Florida, and it wasn't that long after 9-11. And so these guys came up and they were armed. And they came and said, looked at me, because of course he told them that I was causing trouble, which I wasn't. I was just trying to not let, what would you say, an arrogant bureaucratic scum rat take advantage of me. <laughs> so, which is not the same as causing trouble. So anyways, as soon as the cops came up, I said, look, I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do right now, and I'm not going to cause any trouble. But I would like you to hear what actually happened. And so that, that's a good example of a situation like that. It's like, if someone's got you, no brava, bravado. It's a very bad idea. And I was going to do exactly what they told me. Because, you know, they didn't know who I was. And I didn't know what they had been told. So Buddha goes outside the walls. But his father, who's a good father, although somewhat conservative, decides he's going to rig the game a little bit. So he gets rid of everybody that's diseased or unhappy or uncomfortable or ugly or old or anything that could possibly disturb the Buddha. And he lines the streets with flower-waving women and puts pedals on the road and sends his son out in a gilded chariot. But the gods who are lurking around, right, the troublemaking gods who represent chaos and disorder and the unknown, decide to send in front of Buddha a sick man who hobbles unsteadily into view. And Buddha asks his, his retainer precisely what this phenomena represents. And his retainer says, well, you know, human beings like you, since you're human, are subject to the deterioration of these, their physical powers in an arbitrary way. And this man is one person who's been so afflicted. And so Buddha is completely disenchanted by his exploratory move out into the terrible unknown and runs back into the castle walls and shuts the door and is perfectly happy to think of nothing for months. But then, as his anxiety habituates and his curiosity grows, he can't stand the notion of never going outside the walls again, and outside he goes again. And this time, after his father prepares the route ever so carefully, the gods send in sight an old man who hobbles into view. And Buddha looks at him in shock and horror and says to his retainer, just precisely what's going on here? And his retainer says, well, that's an old man. And everybody gets old, and you're going to get old too. And that's the way of all humanity. And that's the point at which Buddha's self-consciousness expands not to only include the possibility of degeneration, but to include 
the temporal horizon that's characteristic of life, and he finds that so terribly shocking that he runs back into the castle and shuts the walls down and plays with his friends for another six months or maybe a year till his anxiety finally habituates and he goes out one final time. And this time the gods send a funeral parade for him and he sees his first dead body and this is such a terrible shock to him that he can't even go back to the castle. So his father prepares for him a great party in the woods near the castle full of new dancing women who are perfectly willing to flaunt themselves and to offer themselves to him. But Buddha is so absolutely and catastrophically shocked by this notion of emergent death that he can't take any pleasure whatsoever in what's being offered to him. And he leaves the kingdom once and for all. And you think, well, it's exactly what happens to you when you grow up, right? If you're reasonably well socialized and properly looked after, then your curiosity gets the better of you and you keep going out into the world until what your parents have established for you is no longer sufficient for you. And as a consequence of that movement out into the world, you find out all sorts of things characteristic of your own life that not only your parents can't precisely explain to you, but even the broader formal structures of your culture have a very difficult time handling. And when you finally do encounter such realities and allow their effect on you to fully manifest itself, well then you're finally independent and you no longer can return home. But from that point forward, you're also burdened as Adam is burdened when he loses his paradisal unself consciousness with the full revelation of what it means to be limited and alive. So there's the memory function of, of, of the unconscious and there's the dis dissolutive function. That's an interesting one. The unconscious contains habits, once voluntary, now automatized and dissociated elements of the personality which may lead a parasitic existence. That's an interesting one. I would relate that more to procedural memory. You know, so what you've done is practice certain habits, whatever they might be, let's call them bad habits, and you like those things to get under control, but you can't. So maybe when you're speaking, for example, you use like and you know, and you say um a lot, and you've practiced that, so you're really good at it, and you'd like to stop it, but you don't get to, because you've built that little machine right into your being, right? It's neurologically wired, and it's not under conscious control, and anything you practice becomes that. It becomes part of you, and, and that's another element of the unconscious, a different part. And then there's a creative part, which is that, well, you know, you're sitting around and maybe you're trying to write something, or maybe you want to uh, produce a piece of art or a piece of music, or maybe you're just laying in bed dreaming, and you have all these weird ideas, and especially in dreams. It's like, what? where do those things come from? And so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny, and you can assume that you're going to do it badly. And that's really useful because you don't have to beat yourself up. It's pretty easy to do it badly. But the thing is, it's way better to do it badly than not to do it at all. And that's the continual message that echoes through these historical stories in Genesis. It's like, these are flawed people. They, they should have got the hell out of their house way before they did. Um, and they go out and they stumble around in tyranny and famine and self-betrayal and... and violence, and, but it's a hell of a lot better than just rotting away at home. And that's, the, that's great, so that's good. And so why is that? Well, okay, so you, you start your path and you think that you're heading you know, towards your star, and so you go in that direction. And then, because you're here, the world looks a particular way, but then when you move here, the world looks different, and you're different as a consequence of having made that voyage. And so, what that means is that now that thing that glimmers in front of you is going to have shifted its location. Because you weren't very good at specifying it to begin with, and now that you're a little sharper and more focused than you were, it's, it's going to reveal itself with more accuracy to you. And so then, you have to take a, you know, it's almost like a 180 degree reversal. But it isn't, because, you know, you've... I mean, you've gone this far, and that's a long ways to get that far. But that's a lot farther than you would be if you just stayed where you were, waiting. And so, it doesn't matter that you overshoot continually. Because as you overshoot, even if you don't learn what you should have done, you're going to continually learn what you shouldn't keep doing. And if you learn enough about what you shouldn't keep doing, then 
that's tantamount at some point to learning at the same time what you should be doing the problem with lying is that it's a hydra and kids find this out very early, because you tell one lie and what happens is it has one of the consequences that you expect maybe you get away with it, but it has three or four others that you don't expect and so it's like it grows some, some complexity and then you have to tack a lie on each of those little complexity outcrops and then they grow three more complexities and soon this little lie turns into a great big ball of lies and at some point it becomes painfully evident to everyone and by that time you're in such, you see this with politicians like that guy who was sexting um, Anthony, Weiner. We, Anthony Weiner, yeah perfect name for him man, it's so <laughs> funny uh, I, I shouldn't make that comment because it's so obvious but it's still funny <laughs> but you know he, that's exactly what happened to him, it's like it wasn't even so much the event because you know people are stupid, they make mistakes and actually the public is somewhat forgiving if you say yeah, geez, I'm a real moron, and you know, like really, seriously, how could I do that? But I did, and like, I'll try not to do it again. But what happens with politicians is, and, and I'm not speaking specifically of politicians, is they'll make an error, and it gets exposed, and then they make three others trying to cover it up. It happened with Nixon, for example, and then the whole thing just turns into a complete scandal. And maybe they could have got out of it at the beginning by just telling the truth. It's like, yes, I'm an idiot. So what happens to Buddha as a consequence of this revelation? He becomes an apprentice and the chronicles of the Buddhist adventure are careful to say that he becomes the world's most proficient practitioner of Samkhya which was a philosophical precursor to yoga and then to yoga so he masters all the positions and the asanas until he's disciplined physically to an almost unlimited degree and then he decides that he'll adopt a stance of world renunciation, which is also something he's remarkably good at and he starves himself until the chroniclers say he resembles nothing so much as a pile of dust and then having exhausted all the disciplinary structures that his sophisticated culture has to offer him but still not precisely finding the answer that he's looking for he retreats into the forest, a place of the unknown and sits himself at the base of a tree Underneath the tree, he's visited by visions and temptations. The first vision is an essentially erotic one. Life itself tempts him back out of his self-conscious state into the domain of pure physical pleasure. A perfectly reasonable temptation, right? And one that's powerful enough so that Hindu philosophers say, as their churches and cathedrals are covered with erotic drawings, if you can't get past the erotic drawings into the church, that's the domain that you should still inhabit, right? In the dawning phases of life, at least till middle age, that's the appropriate mode of being, to be enticed and seduced by the physical pleasures that life has to offer. But in the final analysis, those are not sufficient to solve the problem of emergent self-consciousness. And so the angel of death visits him and offers him the opportunity to exist permanently in a state of nirvana, a very very interesting twist on the story because you have to wonder given the association say between suicidality and the notion of paradise that exists underneath that if what Buddha isn't being offered by the angel of death is in fact death and the cessation of all the problems of being regardless he rejects that, attains enlightenment briefly and then decides to return to the world to share what he's discovered with all of suffering humanity the idea being that the Buddha, who is the awakened or enlightened one, is capable of attaining a transcendent state, but also knows fully that because human beings have a shared social aspect, it is not possible for any one person to attain redemption until all people attain redemption. One of the things that's really weird about dreams, and almost impossibly weird, is that you're an observer in the dream. It's like a dream is something that happens to you. Well, you're dreaming it, theoretically, so how is it that you can be an observer? It's almost like you're watching a video game or a movie, but you're producing it, at, at least in principle, although the psychoanalysts would say, well, no, not exactly, your ego isn't producing it, your unconscious is producing it, it's a different thing. It's a different thing, and of course Jung would say, well, it's deeper than that, the collective unconscious might be producing it. It's in some sense... It isn't you exactly, or it isn't the you that you think of when you think of you. And that's the ego from the Freudian perspective, the you that you identify with, that's the ego. And outside of that is the unconscious, the id, 
that's more the place of impulses and you could think about those as the biological subsystems that can derail your thinking right and that govern things like hunger and sex and aggression and your basic instincts is another way of putting it and it's a reasonable way of thinking about it because these are subsystems that you share with with animals you share them certainly with mammals you share most of them with reptiles you share a lot of them with amphibians and even going all the way down to crustaceans there's commonality for example in the dominance hierarchy circuits and so these are very very old things and the idea that you're in control of them is well you're not exactly in control of them and I would say the less integrated you are the less you're in control of them and the more they're in control of you and that can get really out of hand you know uh, you can be like with people who have obsessive compulsive disorder for example which 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 is which seems to be I would say the dissolutive elements in some sense of the unconscious the way that it's portrayed here poor people with obsessive compulsive disorder they can spend half their time doing things that they can't really control and they have very strong impulses to do them and it's very hard on them to block them you know they they'll almost panic if those things are blocked and then you have people with Tourette's syndrome you know that they'll be doing all sorts of weird dances and and spouting off obscenities and 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 imitating people without being able to control it and and Sometimes a little bit of antipsychotic medication can dampen that down, but it's as if there are these autonomous semi spirits inside of them that grip control over their behavior and make them do things. And you know, you find that to some degree in your own life because maybe you've become very attracted to someone, even maybe you don't want to be attracted to the person, and then you find yourself, you know, texting them when you know perfectly well that you should be going to bed and you know, you're, you're in a grip of something, and, and you can't control it, and that's all part of the unconscious, and all part of what Freud was studying. Imagine that you're trying to become enlightened, which might mean to turn all those parts of you on that could be turned on. You think, well, that's just a linear pathway uphill, you know, it's just from one success to another. It's, no, it's not. It's like, here you are, and you're not doing too badly, and the first step is a complete bloody catastrophe. It's worse. And then maybe you can pull yourself together, and you hit a new pl plateau, and then that crumbles and shakes, and bang, it's worse again. And so, because part of the reason that people don't become enlightened is because it's punctuated by intermittent deserts, essentially, by intermittent catastrophes. And if you don't know that, well, then you're basically screwed, because you go ahead on your movement forward, and you collapse, and you think, well, that didn't work, I collapsed. It's like, no, that's par for the course. It's not indication that you failed, it's just indication that it's really hard. And that when you learn something, you also unlearn something. And the thing you unlearned is probably useful, and unlearning it actually is painful. You know, let's say if you have to get out of a bad relationship. It's like not every, not any, there isn't any relationship that's 100% bad. And so when you jump out of it, well, maybe you're in better shape, but you're still lonesome and disoriented, and you don't know what your past was, and you don't know what your present is, and you don't know what your future is. It's, that's not, that's why people stay with the devil they know instead of, you know, looking for the devil they don't know. The fact that you're full of faults doesn't mean you have to stop. And thank God for that, that's a really useful thing. And the fact that you're full of faults doesn't mean that you can't learn. And so you can posit an ideal and you're going to be wrong about it, but it doesn't matter because what you're right about is positing the ideal and moving towards it. If the actual ideal isn't conceptualize perfectly, well first, surprise, surprise, because like, what are you going to do that's perfect? So, it doesn't matter that it's imperf imperfect, it just matters that you do it and that you move forward. So that's really, that's really positive news as far as I'm concerned, because you can actually do that, right? You can do it badly, anyone can do that, so that's, that's useful. Okay, so like if you were an efficient person, you would have just done that. But you're not, but who cares, you know, you, you still end up in the in the same place, and maybe the trip is even more interesting, who knows. I hope you enjoyed Jordan Peterson Lectures compilation. Please like the video and subscribe to my channel for similar content. See you on the intellectual dark web.